stream. Jim, we are live. Take it away. Well, okay. My name is Jim Warbeneth. Some of you, well, there are two people here. You probably, you may know me as a war game designer. I'm also a political scientist and military historian. I've got masters in both. And what I'm going to do today is talk about um, seacoast fortifications, especially in the 19th century, as part of American um, defense policy. And it's actually a subject that's been very dear to me for a very long time since I started visiting forts as a small child. And also, too, we have to... Uh, it, it combines engineering, it combines artillery, it combines policy, budget, and it was a keystone of American uh, foreign policy. Not just foreign policy, domestic, national security. And for several reasons. Now, uh, let me see if I can get my uh, PowerPoint up here. I guess nobody can see that. Brent, how do I get up PowerPoints? You need to be sharing your screen down at the bottom. There's a, if you go to the very bottom, there's a share screen option. And ah, you okay, can pick a I specific see. application from there. Yeah, okay. Let's see. Okay, that's, I got the options. Now, let me just share screen here. Okay, can you all see my screen now? Can everybody see my uh, the PowerPoint? Yep, you're there. We were seeing okay. Pittsburgh for a second. Yeah, that's my picture to go looking down from Mount Washington, as we call it, Mount Washington. So we're going to look at coastal defense, both the artillery and especially though the engineering uh, that housed it, as part of American form American policy. Uh, especially through the 19th century until it all really ended in 1950. Now, seacoast fortification was especially important from the very beginning. And by seacoast fortification, I mean forts that guarded harbors, uh, river estuaries, not the ones on the frontier. And these would not be out in the middle of nowhere, just looking over empty ocean. These would be near metropolitan areas and seaports and naval bases, uh, places that were worth defending. Now, these were in, uh, under the care of the United States Army, not the Navy. And the assets devoted here were actually charged. These are kind of unique, and it's the United States Army charged with fighting someone else's Navy. These were cost effective. You could build a fort, you could have a fairly small garrison, maintain it, and then in wartime fill it up with a garrison. And you did not have long-term pay for uh, soldiers. You did not have, um, surprisingly too, the, the maintenance costs weren't that bad if they were built well. Sometimes this was a substitute for the Navy. It was the belief for the 19th century that a Navy could be provocative it could go into other people's waters, cause trouble, uh, provoke hostilities with the United States. And maybe the best example of this was the Trent Affair during the Civil War, where a British packet ship, the Trent, was stopped by the USS San Jacinto, and two Confederate diplomats were taken off. And the accounts, the analyses, sometimes say we came close to war with Britain. Others say that Lincoln and the British backed off pretty quickly. But the fact was, it did prove to be a danger. So this argument that a Navy could, co could actually cause trouble uh, did have some currency in the 19th century. By contrast, a seacoast fortification wasn't. If that got into a conflict with a foreign power, they had to cross, they had to cross an ocean, eyeball it, and shell it before there was a problem. They had to provoke us. So there was a safety factor in it's not provocative, it's not going to create diplomatic problems, and it's also consistent with the American reluctance at the time to engage in foreign entanglements. We stay in our fortress America, if you will, play America first, defend ourselves, and we're no threat to anyone. 
they can be a threat to us and we will deal with them with our seacoast fortifications. Now, in the early stages, the United States was totally dependent on foreign engineers. This was not a skill set that we had. Whoops. And for the most outstanding example would be Tadeusz Kosciuszko and the American Revolution, the Polish revolutionary and engineer who fortified West Point. He had actually taken over from a Dutch guy who had screwed up the job. Kosciuszko started over and, start, and created a fortification that never fell to the British, despite the best intentions, worst intentions of Benedict Arnold. The only way it probably could have fallen was be, was by betrayal, and um, Arnold got caught before it could happen. Now, this dependence on foreign talent lasted after independence. We remained dependent on foreign, especially French engineers. We were not home growing our own. good example is Fort McHenry. This was designed by a Frenchman named Jean Fonsin and built between 1798 and 1800. Now, in 1802, the United States did something about this. We trained, or we started the United States Military Academy at West Point, coincidence, or not. That was founded in 1802 to train American engineers to replace the foreigners. And this is something that is a misunderstanding with a lot of my college students. You ask them, why was West Point founded? What is its purpose? And they say, oh, it's to train army officers. Not necessarily. That's not the first uh, priority, not back then especially. The priority was to train engineers who could also be army officers. And for many years, the top graduates were uh, assigned to the engineers, not the infantry or the cavalry. Now, a friend of ours, Al Nofi, Dr. Al Nofi, the game designer, I attended a uh, presentation, in fact, I presented at uh, the New York Military Affairs Symposium, where he, he would talk about West Point as that little engineering school up the Hudson. By the way, does anybody have any questions so far? Feel free to unmute your speakers. Yeah, Brian. Well, I wasn't going to unmute. I was telling folks to just throw the questions up in the chat, and we'll get to them kind of between slides as you do it. Uh, oh, okay. Since you're talking about West Point, um, a, a frequent name for West Point amongst the non-West Point Army officers out there is the Southern Hudson Institute of Technology. That fits. That fits. Hey, hey this, is, this is Aaron. I'm, I'm holding my fire till Jim gets through his, his presentation, but I will went to Norwich University, which was started by a guy kicked out of West Point, so we have that much going for us. Okay, that sounds good, because you... I know Norwich. I teach uh, Alden, Alden Partridge, considered the father of ROTC, he got kicked out of West Point, then went and started Norwich and ended up being the father of Army ROTC, so there you go. You can fail at West Point and still do well. Absolutely. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm teaching at American Public University System, and my second master's is from a mil American military university. So I know Norwich very well. It's a good school. Okay, I've got a picture up here of Fort McHenry. And this is actually a very traditional type fort. If you've studied Fort Pitt near Maine, or any of the frontier forts, or many of the ones in Europe, this will look totally familiar. You've got five bastions. You've got curtain walls between them uh, to protect the approaches in between the bastions. And it's in the style pioneered by Sebastien Le Presse de Vauban. Vauban, I hope I'm pronouncing it right. My French is atrocious. But uh, this is a typical Vauban style fortification engineered by a Frenchman. And the United States wanted engineers who could do this kind of work without outsourcing it to foreign powers. And this is the type of fort that we're going to start with during the Revolution and immediately afterward. And, of course, this is where the National Anthem was inspired with the British attack in uh, uh, 1814. And it's definitely worth a visit from historical perspectives, from the engineering perspectives, uh, just as an American. Now, these early forts after independence tended to be masonry and brick-faced. 
one of the advantages here by putting up masonry is that it will protect the fort from the weather. The weather is going to be more of a threat to many forts than uh, the enemy will. good example for the frontier is Fort Pitt. They had one side that was fronted with brick to protect it from uh, floods. That side held up pretty well. The others were eroded. But masonry and brick will help the fort last longer. You have an earthworks like uh, Fort McHenry, put up brick, put up masonry. It's not going to protect that well against enemy fire, but it will protect it against Mother Nature. And as I stated before, the Vauban-style design with bastions and connecting walls was the original pattern. They used muzzle-loading artillery and lots of it, dozens of guns. You needed a lot of guns to create the firepower to protect uh, the approaches and the estuaries, the rivers that you were trying to. You just couldn't do it with one big Guns of Navarone-style battery. And these, gun, these cannon, you needed a lot of them to control the area. So these were smaller guns, 24 pounds and up, generally up, uh, sided with encasements or through, um, or through the ramparts. And you needed a fairly large number of men to, make, to, uh, to run the artillery. However, a lot of these forts were intermittently manned. They have skeleton crews just with caretaking duties during peacetime. So this adds to the appeal of cost effectiveness. You're not going to need tons of guys all the time to maintain this fort. Most of the time you just have less than a dozen, uh, basically to make sure it didn't fall apart. And this is the patterns that we had going through the first half of the 19th century. Going up to the Civil War, we had a transition to more masonry-based fortifications. Not so much earth as stone or brick. Uh, thick with uh, deep con uh, casements, uh, thick walls, but less reliance on earth, more reliance on masonry. These tended to get larger and larger. You would have systems of forts that had interconnecting fields of fire. You might have uh, connections between them, forts serving each other. New York City is a great example where you had forts on Staten Island, you had Governor's Island, which was the longest occupied American military post in North America. You would have systems, larger systems, instead of just one fort. And also, too, you got a greater variety of designs that built on that old European uh, Vauban style. Castle Clinton, for example, was built in uh, the Battery area of Manhattan. That was built in 1811. That is a round masonry fort. It's kind of flattened on one end, but it's basically round. Fort Sumter is a pentangle in uh, Charleston Harbor. Now this was built over an extended period, 1829 to 1861. It was just finished when the Union garrison moved from Fort Moultrie to Fort Sumter and was shelled by the South Carolina troops. The re one reason why this took so long to build is one, it's big. Two, they built it on an artificial island in the middle of Charleston Harbor. So you see a greater um, ambition by this homegrown generation, generations of American engineers. And Fort Sumter, like some of the others that I've looked at, it's a pentangle. It's not a bastion fort. It's a bastion in its own right. And as I said, you see artificial islands like Fort Sumter. That's probably the best example. Or you can build on top of an existing one like Fort Jefferson and the dry Tortugas. You have larger artillery. There's still smooth board transitioning to rifled um, garrison guns, but there's still muzzle loaders. And you still, you still need a bunch of them, sometimes dozens, in order to get the job done. Here's a picture of Fort Clinton in modern times. You can see the flattened end. It's round. It was originally on an island that is now part of Manhattan. 
but that was repurposed too in the 19th century. It was an immigration holding station before Ellis Island. Um, it was a concert hall. They built an aquarium on top of it for a long time, and then that was torn down. Robert Moses ended up moving the aquarium, I believe, to Coney Island. Uh, he hated this fort. He wanted it torn down, but it was so well built that it just couldn't be done. So he, he just sort of let it, let it rot, and letting it rot didn't even wreck it. So it is now restored as a tourist site in Lower Manhattan. And, of course, we have Fort Sumter. Uh, we see two decks of uh, gun emplacements here. You can see the uh, number of guns that are required. Today, Fort Sumter, of course, is about half this height, thanks to the United States Navy in the Civil War. They did a very good job of shelling it, just never retook it. And it's really a monument to the early stages of American fortification by the fact that it did hold out so long against a prolonged Union siege. Now, the Civil War sees a little bit of regression in the art of fortification. The Union is less dependent on its seacoast fortifications because there's not much danger of a huge Confederate fleet sailing up the Potomac or the Hudson. I mean, they have a fleet. They have, some, uh, they have a few uh, ironclads operating by themselves, but they're not going to attack a major harbor. So what a lot of these forts end up being used for, like Fort Delaware, on the approaches to Philadelphia, that's used as a prison uh, camp for Confederate POWs. But the Union starts downgrading its fortifications. If we had had a major war with Europe, I'm sure they would have been pressed back into service. But also, too, we would have had bigger problems with the Royal Navy. Uh, the Union emphasis was on offensive missions against the Confederacy, invading the Confederacy, executing Winfield Scott, a Virginia general, executing his anaconda strategy against the Confederacy and choking them to death. This doesn't mean sitting back in your forts like we're going to be doing if we're going to fight the British or the French. The Confederates regressed. They needed forts in a hurry. They would often just build them out of dirt. And good examples here are Fort McAllister and Fort Fisher. Um, these were built basically out of dirt using, and especially at Fort Fisher, they used enslaved Lumbee Indians from North Carolina. They were not worried about long-term maintenance, so they didn't need or especially want masonry facings. They needed a fort here and now, so they built them out of dirt. They're easier to build, they're easier to engineer, you need uh, fewer materials brought in from elsewhere, you don't need rock. You don't need stone. You don't need brick. And like I said, there's no expectation of these lasting long term. Now here we actually have a parallel with the North. They built a navy largely out of green wood. And they knew green wood was going to rot. But Gideon Wells, the Secretary of the Navy, figured that the war would be over before the ships fell apart. The Confederates took a similar attitude when it came to fortification. And they did have hey, a person. Genesis, uh, yeah, yeah Aaron. This is Aaron Hayes. Well, I, I mean, I, I live here in, in Maryland near the D.C. area, and so there's a lot of the, the D.C. forts here, um, yeah. Fort Stevens being one of the most famous. I had a great, great, great uncle who was killed, one of the few people killed in the battle there, the handful that were killed there. Um, and all of the Union, you know, these forts were also built from dirt. Isn't there an advantage to those as well as far as being able to absorb the rounds, particularly anything that's rifled and, you know, the cannonballs? You're not going to get a shatter effect. It's just going to kind of, the dirt earth is just going to kind of swallow these rounds up in a lot of ways. Absolutely, yes, Aaron. And that's something that we're going to get to with Fort Pulaski. You can build these in a hurry. Yes, I I was stationed near there, Fort Stewart, many years ago. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I was at uh, Fort Pulaski, I guess it was about 15 years ago. I hope it's repaired since the floods and the hurricanes. But, yeah, that's something that we're going to get into in a little bit. But dirt does have the example, it does have the advantage that when a cannonball hits, it doesn't go kaboom, you get a nice splat. And this yeah. is why you can still see the ruins of Fort McAllister. It just looks like piles of dirt. Fort Fisher, some of that is underwater. 
but uh, it's still there even without all that maintenance. You can still recognize it. And as you said, the Fords in D.C., they were dirt. They have that advantage. You had the troops for the most part to maintain them, and you can get them up in a hurry. It's a pick and shovel job. It's not a, a major engineering project. Yeah. I mean, the only real major engineered ones we had here, obviously, was Fort Washington on Southern Approach on the Potomac. Right. Coming up the bay. And then Battery Hunt, which is across from there. There's a couple of batteries over there. Yes. And, of course, those are all still standing. But, I mean, they, you know, Fort Washington had its, had its chance to shine, and it failed miserably during the War of 1812. So that was that. Oh, um, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And, the, and Fort Washington is a good example of one of those early Vauban style forts that was a variation of it. You can see bastions, you can see curtain walls, but it's not as symmetrical as Fort McHenry. And yeah, you're right, they had one job and they didn't do it. And the uh, yep. British got loose with matches. Yeah, they got loose with matches, and Dolly Madison had to run out the back door of the White House with all their paintings. So. <laughs> Yeah, a little personal footnote here. My grandma had a sugar bowl that is now in the possession of my mother that was supposedly taken out of the White House with, by Dolly Madison, supposedly. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> and, and we do have a – go. I'm sorry. Well, we do have a precedent here uh, for building dirt forts, and it goes back to the 80 years war when the Dutch were fighting for their independence against Spain. The Dutch adapted, some would say stole, but they adapted Italian engineering techniques for building forts, but they would build them just out of dirt because they needed them in a hurry. They didn't have the resources, and it was better to have an imperfect fort now, worry about the maintenance later, when you had the Duke of Parma coming down on you. So the Dutch became real masters of building dirt forts, and later on, then they would make them more permanent. But you could see the Confederates, and in this case, Aaron, like you said, the Union, following that Dutch precedent of um, using existing plans, but making it purely out of Earth. Fort Pulaski. Fort Pulaski is really a turning point in American military engineering. It's one of these pre-war masonry forts it's on an island, it's pentangular like Fort Sumter, and it's taken over by the Confederates on the Savannah River. It's besieged by the Union forces for two days in April 1862, and what is really significant is it's two days. You can expect a fort usually to last for weeks if it's, if it's strong at all. You could expect a fort even to last a month or more, or like Fort Sumter, uh, withstood a major siege uh, through much of the Civil War. Fort Pulaski falls in like two days. Why? Because of a, the tactics by the Union commander, Quincy Gilmore, sort of a forgotten figure, but in terms of fortification and negating it, uh, he's extremely important. And what he does, he brings up rifled siege artillery. Accurate, high velocity, a lot more efficient than the muzzle loaders they were using, and he could outrange the Confederate artillery within the fort, and it's easily breached. Now, the, um, the custom at the time was that when a fort or a city had its walls breached, then honor was served and the, and the defenders were, it was okay for them to surrender. Okay, the walls are breached, we don't want a massacre, let's surrender. Now, in this case, in two days, they got a breach, and it was very obvious that the fort was doomed, so the Confederates surrendered. A two-day siege with technologically advanced rifled artillery, this is a turning point. Here's a map of Fort Pulaski, and what you can see here is that while the forts were usually built to fight the Navy, uh, Gilmore puts his siege batteries on shore, and concentrates his fire on the on the southeastern uh, face of the fort, which, marked, which is marked A, A and B. Uh, fort Pulaski has 47 guns. It can't really do anything. Gilmore just sort of sits back on uh, on uh, Tybee, Big Tybee Island, punches a hole in it, 
on a reserved Fort Falls. The Savannah River ends up being blocked by the Union. So this affects Confederate commerce. You can blockade the river without using a fleet now because you took the pre-war fort. Uh, it's an interesting place, like I said, to visit. You can still see some of the damage that was not totally repaired after the Union captured it, um, where Gilmore breached it. But this is a turning point in fortification, one that we really don't talk about very much, but it's there and it is worth noting. Any thoughts, any questions on this? Floor is open. No, just, just emphasize your point. I remember I was there, and I was there like 30 years ago. Yeah. Last time I was there, you know, they emphasized the damage, and it really was the death knell for these Mason-type forts, um, you know, the, the, which is probably why during World War II, yeah, the Army occupied a lot of these forts and kind of, you know, did, quote, coastal defense, but they didn't put an awful lot of money into them. No. And what they did do is something we'll get into. They put in more modern batteries, for example. Yeah, that was the thing. Yeah, Fort Sumter, half the parade ground is taken up by a later battery from the Endicott period. So Fort Yeah, recently, a couple of years ago, I was down, at, um, down in Key West, Florida, and saw the some of the fortifications they have down there, one on the Truman Annex and the other one nearby. And, you know, it was, um, once again, you know, World War II, they're more worried about U-boats than anything else. Absolutely. And by World War II, what, what I'm going to get into is that is really the death knell of Seacoast fortification. They did use it, especially at Manila and Wake Island, but uh, Seacoast fortification really died in World War II. But it goes through a period of modernization after the Civil War. And as you noticed, you see these modern uh, batteries right on top of the old forts. Fort Moultrie has a couple of uh, later, late 19th century batteries on top. Uh, well, not on top of the fort itself, but as outer works. Uh, same thing for Fort McHenry. You have um, Civil War works, Civil War batteries on the edge of the water. So they're, t they're always taking these old forts and trying to repurpose them where they can. Sometimes not just as concert halls and aquariums like uh, Castle Clinton, but as actual seacoast fortifications, and sometimes they are useful. Uh, most of the time, though, they're prison camps. Now, the next period we're going to look at is the Endicott period of 20 years, 1805 to 1905. And this includes the Spanish-American War, which was a spark to... Uh, restart fortification, modernization, and construction. This was under the Board of Fortifications consisting of Army and Navy officers and civilians. Uh, this was led by the Secretary of War, William C. Endicott, and they were charged with modernizing Seacoast fortification, which remained extremely important because most of this time, well, especially at the beginning, the United States was still relying on a wooden navy. Our Navy was third or fourth rate for the most part. There was no way that we could have challenged the British, especially since the British had a Navy that was uh, supposed to be bigger than number two and number three combined and was also a bellwether for modernization. There's no way we're going to take those guys on, not on the sea. So we emphasize fortification. Again, it's not provocative. It's cost efficient and it protects Fortress America without provoking those other guys. And Endicott is the one that chairs this committee. First thing, as we discussed, too, is the end of masonry fortifications. Uh, you're not going to build your forts out of bricks and stones anymore. No matter how thick they are, they're not going to uh, shatter when they're hit by rifled uh, ammo. We go with concrete. And these batteries tend to be lower. They're stronger. They're not so spectacular. They're architecturally kind of ugly. And many of them, too, they're painted dull black uh, so that the sun doesn't clear off the uh, gray concrete. They're able to take a hit and inflict a hit with fewer but larger rifled artillery pieces. Um, 
the real typical one here would be 12 inches. And they're also disappearing guns. They don't go down into it. They, they're not located in the casement anymore. They're located on top in a depression, and you'd have a lever system uh, like uh, that would swing up, shoot the gun, and draw it back down before the enemy could counter battery fire. Um, it's a good idea against uh, conventional naval vessels, but of course, with, this is right before air power. But the disappearing gun is the main weapon. Also, seacoast mortars. These are large siege mortars, upwards of 12 inches, designed to fire a high trajectory armor piercing uh, round that would come down through the deck. The best examples of, th of these that I've actually studied in action were used inland, where the Germans used them as siege guns at uh, Liège, Belgium, especially at Fort de Lausanne. And one was able to penetrate through the concrete, through the soil, into a powder mag uh, an ammo magazine, and basically blow the turrets into the air and on top of the fort upside down. That's technological surprise, but the technology actually existed for shooting at ships rather than uh, inland forts. So seacoast mortars make their a uh, real debut here. They're not disappearing guns. These are located in pits, anchored into the earth. And something, too, to bear in mind, the Army can use larger guns, not larger caliber, but heavier barrels, heavier mountings than the Navy can because theirs are anchored on the earth rather than a ship with uh, limited displacement. So the Army has more freedom here to use larger, more effective weapons without having to worry about uh, carrying them around. Now, the Taft period follows in, uh, starting in 1905. And this time, the Secretary of War is William Howard Taft. Taft is one of those public servants I don't think ever gets enough credit. He's kind of a mediocre president, never wanted to be president. His wife nagged him into it. Um, fat guy who got stuck in the bathtub, except it's not true. He did invent the seventh inning stretch, which is true. Uh, Taft was Secretary of War, even though he's the most non-military person you're going to find, uh, and a fairly effective one. He was also military governor of the Philippines, president of the United States, and also the only president to also become chief justice after leaving office. And he was a very good chief justice of the Supreme Court. Uh, really an all-purpose public servant who considered himself a judge and a lawyer, first and foremost. Not a politician, and certainly not a soldier. There's a famous picture of him in the Philippines riding a water buffalo, and uh, I think it's cruelty to the water buffalo. But he's, uh, he's an intelligent man with good judgment in a lot of ways, and he takes over the fortifications after Endicott and modernizes, modernizes them still further with even more construction. He continues the trends of the Endicott period with the reinforced concrete um, uh, batteries using smaller but bigger guns. And these are to respond to super dreadnoughts. Before you're thinking about shooting at a battleship with a a four gun 12 inch main battery now we're looking at something like Queen Elizabeth class with eight uh, 14 inch guns you're looking at the um, the second well the uh, the uh, especially the HMS dreadnought and those that followed in similar ships in uh, the German Navy in the French Navy so you need bigger guns to deal with bigger and badder battleships but you need fewer of them Instead of having like 47 guns like Fort Pulaski had, you could do the same job with two guns, maybe four. And remember, they're bigger than the ones on the battleships. They're better protected in a lot of ways because you've got concrete around them. Uh, you can do a lot of damage with a smaller number of guns, and the cost effectiveness actually increases. I see a similarity here between going from a B-17 which had a crew of five, and you needed 500 to 1,000 uh, bombers to hit a target, to a self-bomber, which is its own force package, 
with a crew of two. On its face, it's more expensive, but it's more efficient because you have uh, fewer airmen and you have fewer aircraft that are more survivable. There's a parallel here with the Taft period fortifications. Fewer men, fewer guns, but more bang for the buck. And instead of having just the 12-inch guns at the end of the caught period, now you've got 14-inch disappearing guns. You have a few 16-inch ones as well, but they're no, not really more effective because these are ones taken from naval vessels that were to be built before the 1922 Washington Naval Treaty. So they repurpose these guns. The Navy takes them over from the Army. I mean, the, Nar the Army takes them from the Navy, but they are the lighter guns for battleships. The 14-inch shore guns are at least as good as those 16-inch guns. They're bigger, they're longer, they're heavier, and they were never built to be carried on a battleship or a battle cruiser of limited displacement. They're built to be carried by the planet Earth. Also, too, this is something that is neglected by a lot of people. The Army had its own minefields, not shore mines, but sea mines. And here's the division of labor. The Navy controlled mines if they were automatic. If a ship bumped into a mine, if it exploded by contact, it was the Navy's. If it, explo if it was set off by a magnetic explo uh, exploder, that's the Navy's. If you had a guy on shore with a switch that would see the ship entering the minefield, he'd throw the switch and blow up a mine underneath that ship. If it was remote controlled, those minefields, even though they're in the water, are actually run by the United States Army. And the Army had its own uh, ships, too, for maintaining these minefields. And many of these were within sight of the forts, which maintained command and control over the minefields. But these are actual Army sea mines maintained by Army crews from Army boats. A good example, too, of fortification was Fort Drum in Manila Bay. This is built over a five-year period. They took El Fraile, El Fraile Island in Manila Bay, which was the site of a French, uh, ah, Spanish fort, saw, uh, cut down the top and built what was termed an unsinkable concrete battleship on top with uh, turret-mounted guns, which were very unusual in the United States Army. Also had six-inch um, secondary weapons and anti-aircraft guns. Uh, Fort Drum was termed the unsinkable battleship, or the concrete battleship. And it's still there in ruins today, but this was one of their more interesting uh, projects under the Taft period. Also, too, do you have a creation of a separate Coast Artillery Corps. This is not the field artillery. These are guys who are specialists in firing coastal guns at ships, not at enemy troops. So this becomes a separate, um, a separate branch under the United States Army. Here's a good example of a disappearing gun. Um, pops up, and then it will pop right back down. But what you can see here, too, is how vulnerable it would be to aerial bombardment. Um, I can see the cost effectiveness in these, but um, they're not exactly built for, a fu for the future. Uh, future with air power. And this is Fort Drum. Uh, two big turrets, and it was never taken by the Japanese until it surrendered. Interestingly, the Americans retook it, and, and uh, when they came back to Luzon, uh, the Japanese refused to surrender. So what the Americans did, combat engineers uh, poured fuel oil and diesel fuel into the fort and then set it on fire. And which is one more reason why it's in ruins now. Uh, it has been stripped by salvagers. It's, a, I understand, a very dangerous place to go, but uh, it's still there. There's no way you're, this, you're ever going to destroy this um, concrete battleship. Now we get to World War II. This is the death knell of American seacoast uh, fortification and artillery. You had the fall of the Philippines. Uh, Manila was heavily defended. Um, Corregidor was 
Well, Corregidor, you can get its mission from the Spanish name. It means guardian. This was the guardian of the harbor with Fort Mills. It was heavily garrisoned with uh, coast artillery and seacoast mortars. And it is basically neutralized by air power. Uh, same thing for the other fortifications, except for Fort Drum. Um, but uh, Corregidor holds out, but it is not able to really defend Manila. They try. And they're, even though the Philippines were uh, low on food, uh, thank you, Douglas MacArthur, that's a whole other presentation. They had enough ammo for the coast artillery that they figured the tubes on the guns would wear out before they ran out of shells. Also, the coast artillery, both the United States Army and Philippine scouts, who were Filipinos serving in the United States Army, not the Philippine Army, uh, were extremely good. And when they did have targets, they were effective. However, they're really trumped by air power. And significantly, too, when Fort when Corregidor is recovered, it's taken by paratroopers, followed by an amphibious landing. So it's that old saying that they built a fortress and didn't put a roof on it. The Philippines are a good example of that. It's really the right weapon in the wrong war. Wake Island actually performs better, and this is defended not by Navy or not by Army Seacoast Artillery, but by a Marine Defense Battalion. And the Marines had their own coast artillery for defending uh, bases, not just the, the ones we started off with, like Wake and Midway, but they were part of War Plant Orange that, as the Navy advanced westward across the Pacific, Marine Defense Battalions would be put in charge of the, in defending the bases that they took and defend them against the Japanese counterattack. They had their own coast artillery, much smaller than the Army's. But at Wake Island, it was fairly effective again until air power, an overwhelming force. And there were Marine Defense Battalions, too, that were deployed to Guadalcanal. But sooner, or, sooner rather than later, uh, these were redirected and used to fill out infantry formations because the American mission became far less defensive and far more offensive. And air power and the Navy were going to do a much better job of protecting the approaches and point defense than the Army was or the Marines. So these were redirected into infantry and field artillery. And the same thing goes for the Army units. They had a lot of remaining coast artillery units, especially in the continental United States, and these were converted into other types of artillery. Heavy field artillery, which proved very useful. Some of this coast artillery was re-equipped with uh, long tom 155mm guns and used effectively in the Marianas. A lot of them became anti-aircraft units, which is totally suitable because the coast artillery was rendered largely obsolete by aircraft. And the Coast Artillery basically ends in 1950. They dissolve the Coast Artillery Corps and its units are reallocated. The manpower is sent into other purposes, especially missile units. Um, the Army's anti aircraft missile units really trace their lineage back to Coast Artillery. And these guys are redirected, reallocated to Nike missile systems, and again, it's the anti-aircraft mission. So in 1950, we can see the end of coast artillery and its um, replacement by anti-aircraft and heavy artillery units. And you can even say, too, that maybe nuclear weapons uh, rendered them obsolete. But I would put most of the credit slash blame for for that on air power in general, conventional air power. So this whole era basically ends in 1950. Now what's next? What we're actually witnessing now is a rebirth of coast defense. The Marines are currently going under a reorganization where they're getting rid of all their armor, reducing their infantry, and putting resources into defensive units that would be used in the event of a war in the Pacific, probably with China, that would, it appears now, use coast-mounted 
missile units against the Chinese Navy. So we're kind of going full circle here, back to coast artillery, but in this case with missiles. And of course, too, we're seeing air power as the arbiter of sea control along with the fleets. So we're seeing at least a limited comeback with uh, coastal artillery, if not these sophisticated coastal defenses. You're not going to see the fortification so much, but you are going to see coast-mounted artillery or coast-mounted uh, missile units instead of artillery. But basically, this whole classic period of sea coast fortification and coastal artillery that the United States relied on for its entire history from, 17, from the 1770s up through 1950, that's over. But we will see a rebirth in a different form, in a different generation, with far more technologically advanced weapons that have a limited connection with all this. So, that concludes my formal presentation, and I open the floor. Yeah, Brent. I actually had a comment come in by email, only because Gordon knows how to get a hold of me by email. But he, he was, uh, I guess, one of the comments that he was wanting to get in there on Fort Pulaski. Um, it wasn't so much that it was necessarily breached in the usual fashion, but the idea that the the fact that the Union could put shells into the interior at will meant that there was no good way they could continue to defend the fort. And at that point, they surrendered and said, all right, you got us. We're out of here. Um, Absolutely. That's not me speaking. That's Gordon. But that's me repeating what Gordon had sent me. <laughs> that ties in with it, actually, because uh, using mortars, uh, which Farragut used at New Orleans, you could always pitch... Uh, exploding shells into the interior of a fort. But now you could do it with flat trajectory weapons at long range through a hole in the walls. Yeah. So, so he's not necessarily wrong. But it does tie in with the idea that now they're vulnerable to these flat trajectory uh, high velocity siege guns as never before. Yeah, and the challenge you always had with the mortars is yes, you could lob rounds into it, but just the physics of the parabola meant you had to get really close to do it, and that usually wasn't good for uh, for, for your continued lifespan. Oh, absolutely. Although you could do it at night, uh, which could be effective. And also, too, if you go back to uh, 1689, the Turks used it very effectively at, uh, at Vienna um, without a huge number of casualties. It depends on how good your artillerymen are, but also to a lab, too, that mortars were not that accurate at the time. Yeah. The Seacoast mortars that were used later were highly accurate. These were not. That it's sort of like every time you shoot, it's a knuckleball. So, therefore, the, the demonstrated vulnerability to flat trajectory siege guns, uh, that's intimidating. And once you get a breach and you can fire in the inside, then the defenders can say, honor is served. It's hopeless. We give up. Uh, we're not cowards. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, uh, just uh, Jim, real quick, Zarin again. Sure. Um, so, from a kind of a big picture point of view, I've heard the U.S. you know coastal fortress system compared to a couple of different things. One called it America's Maginot Line, in yeah. that it was you know obsolete already. I, I mean, in the Civil War, I mean, it, it was all but useless, mainly because, you know, we were already on land. You could get to them from the backside. So, yes. of course, they weren't protected if you needed to. Another interesting, um, when I was back and I was in grad school at George Washington University, I had my roommate did a paper comparing the U.S. coastal defense system to what was then the newest high-tech thing, which was Reagan's strategic defense initiative, you know, in space, SDI. And he compared uh, SDI to our coastal defense system, you know, the fact that it was, it, it's high tech now, but it's going to be, you know, the technology to defeat it's going to outpace it, you know, rapidly. Uh, I thought those were two interesting comparisons. I don't know if you have any thoughts. I mean, was, was it ever really a militarily um, important aspect for 
for for the U.S. and, and the coastal defense system. I was there ever a period of time where it really did matter to have that? I would say in the first half of the 20th century, it did, or the first half of the 19th century, it did. And significantly, the Europeans were still investing in it. <coughs> Excuse me. For example, in 1999, I visited Portsmouth, England, and you have extensive fortifications in the harbor. Now, the whole problem of defending against the land attack, they invested more heavily in that with forts like Fort Nelson, which I visited, Fort, Fort Wellington, which is still used as a research and development center by the British Ministry of Defense. These were ultra-modern forts, no curtain walls. They covered all that intervening ground with fire that could be maintained by territorial militia. Uh, these things were huge, that they were investing not just in the harbor fortifications, but also in the forts to prevent a landward siege. And, of course, too, we had the British investing in Singapore. Uh, to, the defenses at Singapore, we think, oh, geez, the coastal guns couldn't turn and fire at the Japanese. That was totally wrong. Most of them had 360-degree arcs of fire and were capable of indirect fire. The whole problem was they didn't have enough high explosive rounds to take on a land-based enemy. As long as they were fighting at Congo, shooting at Congo-class battleships, they were fine. But when they had to, do that, when they had to shoot at troops, then they got a problem. It just made a big splat in the dirt. So the Europeans were still investing in this. And, of course, the Soviets were investing in uh, massive fortifications at Sevastopol which were taken out by even bigger guns. Uh, the German siege artillery, the, the Morsers, which they gave proper names to, like they were ships, eventually took them out uh, rather than air power. But the Europeans were still buying into this. So if we were totally mistaken, so was everybody else. But in the long run, I think Patton was right that fixed fortifications are testimony to the folly of man. And we also have a lot more coastline than most European nations, particularly once we got to the West Coast and we had double, we doubled everything. So, um, yeah, I, I know we have to get off here because we have to bump to the next Zoom. But, you know, I, I just think about, you know, from, for, for why we're here today, the war game perspective, you know, from the U.S. coastal defenses, not, not so much in Europe because there's a lot of war games on, you know, Sebastopol, or not a lot, but at least there are some that talk about some of these fortifications, but in the U.S., you know, there's not a lot of war games that take into account the U.S. fortification system that I can think of off the top of my head. Is there anything that you can think of off yeah, the top of your head, maybe a couple of the, of the Civil War strategic level games that include them? Well, Victory Civil War certainly does, and on the tactical level, the Ironclads uh, does in uh, micro detail, and the Ironclads expansion kit and Roger Nord's uh, shot and shell, which ties in with it. Uh, that was a, that involved an awful lot of uh, fortifications versus ships, uh, both Union and Confederate. Um, also, too, I gave a presentation at Origins last year on combined operations. Uh, well, tied in with that, it was actually on Grant's uh, Virginia campaign. But Grant was always a master of using rivering forces and land forces together against land defenses, starting with Forts Henry yeah. and Wilson. So, oh, yeah, of course. That would yeah. Be but I would say the best yeah. representation would be the Iron Quads from Yaquina from way back when. One of the challenges yeah. you run into with. Thanks, Jim. Great presentation. Oh, thanks. Yeah, one of the challenges you run into with characterizing them as America's Maginot line. Um, in, in that they were obsolete for what they were designed for, is it doesn't take into account the deterrence factor. And that's the Maginot line not, not only failed as a defensive unit, but it failed as a deterrent. Whereas you could make a case that the, the U.S. coastal forts uh, functioned effectively enough as a deterrent, given that it, it now was no longer enough that you've got to sail across an ocean to get to the U.S. You've got to sail across the ocean and now have to fight against these forts just to, just to taste dirt, right? Just to even yes. get on the land 
and now you've got you know you've got to somehow reduce these things either from at sea or or suck up some major casualties that are hard to replace given the ocean that you have to cross just to get on the ground to try and, and fight these things down and so it it's very easy to look at something like the Maginot line and say it was good or bad or whatever because it actually had to fight it's very hard to look back in history and describe the effectiveness of something that never actually fought. And I think that's, you know, the, the Pershing-2 missiles are another great example of that. Were the Pershing-2 missiles an effective weapon system? We'll never know. Like, they, we never fired one in anger. But were they an effective weapon system in the strategic sense that they brought the Russians to the table for the INF Treaty? Yeah. Yeah, they really worked well for that in that they scared the shit out of the Russians. And the Russians have admitted that, like on the record, that the Pershings scared the crap out of them. And so, you know, it, it is possible to have an effective system that never actually had to be tested in what it was designed to do if it affects other things positively. And I, you can probably make the case for the coastal fort system in that regard. Oh, I totally agree with you, Brad. Also, too, to clarify... We, we had a lot to defend because of those massive coastlines, but not all of it needed to be defended. When you have barrier islands and swamps, you don't have to defend it. You can concentrate your fortifications on the harbors. Uh, for example, New York City was heavily fortified on both ends of Long Island Sound. Boston was heavily fortified. Um, Chesapeake Bay was fortified at its entrance as well as further up towards Fort Monroe, that you didn't have to spread your forces, you didn't have to spread your assets all over the place. Now, on the West Coast, there were very few places that really desperately needed fortified. San Francisco Bay, top of the list. You can concentrate your forces there. You can also concentrate your forces down in the south towards L.A., in San Pedro and San Diego. Uh, further, they, all, they did have mobile artillery that could be moved around within a, a fairly small area. It wasn't all in fixed fortifications. They could move it, on, they could move it be within forts. They could move it outside of the fort. So you have the ability to concentrate your artillery in a few fortifications, and everything else is basically economy of force, if you defend it at all. Yeah. And like, like you said, Brent, you could land an army there, but now you've got to feed it, you've got to supply it, you've got to give it uh, replacements, and you're 3,000 miles at least from your own base areas. That's going to be a tough, uh, that's going to be a tough order. So yeah. I agree with you in a lot of ways that the deterrent factor was, uh, that was present, and it has never been tested. And, and uh, if, if anybody's I, been to California, you know that there's no landing anybody between Morro Bay and Carmel slash Monterey anyway. Because yes. you, you can't unload the ships into a thousand foot cliff. Absolutely. Unless you get those anti-grav devices like you have at Star Trek, forget about it. Um, yeah, I just I just posted the, the NPS link for the fall of Fort Washington here in, in 1814 here south of D.C. How, you know, two years into the war they had two years to get it ready and the day they needed it they had basically five operable guns and a small garrison that voted to surrender you know <laughs> to pull yeah. out so so some uh, you know to me our coastal coastal defense system gets reduced to the to the one time at least near where i live that it, it was supposed to um do its job and it, and it didn't do it very well even though they had theoretically two years to get ready um, oh, yeah. Say love So, anyway, thanks. Thanks, Jim. <laughs> oh, no problem, Aaron. All right, guys. I think we've... Uh, I, let me unmute myself. I, I think we've hit our hour here that... Uh, if anybody's got one last question for Jim, throw it in the chat quick or unmute yourself. Otherwise, I think we're good. I think we can, uh, we can call it here. Uh, the good news is we've got a gap in seminar presentations here from Jim's to the next one starting at 2 o'clock. So... Everybody can grab a bite to eat and take a breather, and then uh, we'll start back up at 2. Um, any last questions, go ahead and throw them in to either the YouTube chat or in the Zoom. And, As a uh, last comment, I have to say, you can see looking down here at my picture of Pittsburgh, you see the outline of Fort Duquesne 
in Point State Park uh, outlined in stone. And then you see the Fort Pitt Museum out by the Fort Pitt Bridge, which is a reconstructed bastion of Fort Pitt. So I, it's kind of appropriate, but I didn't realize that it was uh, <laughs> that it fit in with this presentation. Jim, you don't have anything on your desktop that's a link to something we shouldn't be uh, broadcasting publicly, I hope. Oh, no, no, I got rid of that. Okay. Yeah, not guilty. <laughs> All right. Well, listen, Jim, virtual applause. Thank you very much you. for uh, for joining us for this and uh, to the audience, um, whether you're watching live or recorded through YouTube, we appreciate you taking the time to check this out. And uh, hopefully by the time we get around to another uh, convention like this, whenever it may be, we can actually all do it in person and, uh, and Jim can walk around a podium instead of having to like just rock in his easy chair there. <laughs> yeah, but my great wall of GMT behind me. There you are. I'm sure the GMT guys love it. Um, yeah. All right. Thanks, everybody.